Leo Goodstead is an honorary fellow of the University of Hong Kong and was head of the Hong Kong government's central policy unit from 1989 to 1997. His new book, Poverty in the Midst of Affluence, How Hong Kong Mismanaged Its Prosperity, is now available from the Hong Kong University Press. Please join me in welcoming Mr. Goodstead to the club. Well, I think one of the um, nice things about publishing a book in Hong Kong is that so far the Foreign Correspondents Club has asked me to come and talk about the book. And it's the only real perk an author gets unless he's a bestseller. So thank you very much for having me today and um, for having me to talk on a subject which is as grim and unpleasant at uh, any mealtime as poverty, particularly poverty in Hong Kong. I have to say this is a journalist book. It's a journalist book in the sense that it isn't full of my own ideas or theories. It's not full of anybody else's theories either. It's based on going through the official record, what was said in LegCo, what was said in policy addresses and budgets, what was said in endless questions raised by um, the politicians in LegCo, and then saying, do they make sense? And have they, in fact, made life easier or worse for ordinary men and women in this community. So no claims to originality, just simply a journalist doing the job that journalists do, go check the record, what did they say, and then go and look, about, uh, look at the context and whether it turns out to be sincere and accurate. So let me start with the new poverty that's overtaken Hong Kong. In Hong Kong today, we have poverty of the traditional kind where simply quite a lot of people don't have enough money. But we have also a new poverty which I'll be talking about. And this is not caused by economic recession. It's not caused by financial crisis. We don't have political, industrial, or social strife of any seriousness by comparison with any other city in the world. It has been created exclusively by official decisions to keep the public supply of housing and social services below the basic requirements of this community. And indeed, it goes further than that. It's to start charging for services that were formerly free or almost free and to reduce the supply of them. So let's see what, um, where these begin. And I said it's policy. So we begin with the first chief executive. And if you just bear with me while we look at some of the things he said, he started by saying in 1998, in February, after the Asian financial crisis was really rumbling along, our competitiveness has lagged our competitors. And this was a, a, key, a key issue for him in policymaking. Hong Kong had to become more competitive. The facts were entirely different, the facts available from his own officials. And I quote, only one of these facts, productivity had risen by over 4% annually between 1980 and 1996, over 4%. I mean, anywhere else in the world could claim that? Then he went on to say, later in 1998, the recession is biting, he's preaching austerity, public confidence is disappearing, and he said, there is government sympathy for those people who will be employed in the near future. But he said, it's all part of the fortunes we have to go through. So this is disclaiming responsibility. Then in 2000, Mr. Tung actually is an honest, straightforward man. He's a sincere man. In 2000, he took responsibility. He said it, it could have been, would have been easier to ease back into what he called another bubble economy. And yet, the government's own figures would demonstrate that the bubble was more, more myth than reality. My way, he said, will take longer, imparts more pain in the short term, but is ultimately healthier. So he's deliberately inflicting pain, and he knows what he's doing in the hope that it would be good for people. And then in 2004, he admitted publicly that GDP had fallen 23%. And he made the comparison with the only matching fall he could think of, which was the 
uh, a great crash in the United States in the 1920s. And he went on to say, job losses and reduced income have hit 90% of the families in Hong Kong. So this is where we start, and this is a terrible picture. So we come to, the, come to uh, uh, po what kind of poverty we have. So you know, just let's think about it. It's a permanent million. So we had a commission on poverty set up in 2005, and it came up with a figure of one million below the poverty line. 2012, we have the same figure, one million below the poverty line. That's 15% of the population. We look at employees, and the government in describing these employees below, below the poverty line make it clear that these people are working full time. They're working as skillfully, as diligently as they can. There are no complaints about them as workers. There were 176,000 of them at the height of the financial crisis. And we still had almost 150,000 last year. So, you know, life has got better, but, you know, not, not, not really seriously. And then in 2012, we find that there are 75,000 people in food programs in Hong Kong, and 40% of these are actually employment. And we're supposed to have a minimum law, we're supposed to have social security to support low-wage people. We have them on food programs. We also have what we might call, we had, a lawless labor market. So again, let me talk about our labor force, just to make the point they deserve better. 2002 to 2011, the labor productivity rose by 3.5% per annum in Hong Kong. Singapore, 2.4%. The US, 1.4%. Germany, 0.8%. And by the way, every figure I quote is from government sources. Every figure is government sources. And then we look at what was actually happening in the labor market. 2008, the CPU uh, commissioned the Chinese University to investigate the labor issues which were arising, and they looked in particular at the housing authority. And they found there, the report says, it's a public report, that contract workers were denied their rest days, they were denied their statutory holidays, gross breaches of the law. They also found that half the contractors working for the, hospital, for the housing authority already had convictions for breaking the, law, the labor laws. So in 2011, the government finally, six years after Donald Zhang had promised this, passed a minimum wage law. And among its beneficiaries were 40,000 people working on contracts to supply labor to the government. These people had previously worked in the last century up to the year 2000, 2001, directly from the for the government. They'd been laid off and they're then rehired by the government through private contractors. Over half would need a pay rise of at least 20% to bring them up to the minimum wage. And I have to say that the, 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 the bottom part, the people who are really doing the worst cleaning jobs would require much higher increases than 20%. And the cost to the government of this, how much money was the government saving by this? And the figure is $700 million a year, and that's 0.2% of the government's total expenditure in 2011. Hospitals, the chief executive, in 2005 said there has been no deterioration of service quality. He assured the Legislative Council. So we take his word for it. Almost nobody said this can't be true. But the hospital authority was publishing its annual report and between 2005, 2003 actually, but we start here 2005 to 2008, it regularly said that the cuts in budgets meant that quality had started to fall, 2005. Inadequate funds to buy the new technology in pharmaceuticals, 2008, queues are worsening because of the budget cuts, for all, for particularly for surgery. Now, we've been promised, well, hospital authority beds also decreased by 8% in this period, despite the serious rise in the elderly who need a hospital care. So we come to you know, the impact on individuals here, the sick. And the sick are left in pain because of austerity programs. The law says, the hospital authority ordinance says, that um, no person shall be prevented through lack of means from obtaining adequate medical treatment. In 2006, Dr. York Chow, the health minister, said, 
this duty was being fully met via the Samaritan Fund. So we look at this. 2011, a new community care fund is set up, and this would finance non-Samaritan fund drugs. And who would it finance? Proudly announced seven kinds of cancers. Look at them here. Leukemia, renal, gastrointestinal, breast and ovarian. Very common cancers, frankly. And there'd be a thousand victims of these cancers helped in the first year. What had happened to this thousand in previous years who were all supposed to be guaranteed that they would have access to treatment even if they didn't have enough money? And how many are on the waiting list who are not covered by the new com community care funds provisions for, for, for these cancers? We don't know. We look at mental health, and, and the mental illness uh, field is, 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 is um, dreadful. Dr. York Chow in 2006 said that budget austerity, the budget cuts, were too small to affect the, medical, the, the mental health sector. Yet in 2010, we find the Hong Kong College of Psychiatrists saying we're using, as it were, third world drugs, the previous generation of psychiatric drugs, and they have dreadful side effects, and many patients can't continue with the drugs they need to lead normal lives. Housing market. You know, the, it, every, every part, every part of the system suffers the same kind of situation. As Financial Secretary Jan Yam Kuhn said in 2000, that we have to ensure that this home that we buy, private home, will be a good investment for our own future and a store of value for our children. As Chief Secretary in 2002, he said that the home ownership scheme should be abolished because it com competes unfairly with the private sector, threatening the wealth of all homeowners. Now, what we're being told here is the government unfairly competes, distorts the market, so the public sector withdraws, the private sector will provide the solutions. So we go check what the solutions were. Total supply of new housing fell by 60%. You look at the figures there, you'll see the dramatic fall in the private sector, not just the government sector. The government makes the space for the private sector, and the private sector makes the space bigger. And it's not surprising that in this period, the houses, the, the private sector prices for new, new flats went up by 56%. And then the final part, you know, one of the, the terrible things about Hong Kong is we have a heritage from the past, and we're conditioned to accept certain things about our society without complaint because our parents and our grandparents had them, and housing is the most serious of these. So in 2011, the Urban Renewal Authority said in its, in its annual report, uh, actually said in, a, in, 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 in another report, that 110,000 families live in dirt, decay, and lack of amenities. So the average unit of 500 square feet had three or more families living in it, and the common areas were filthy, prone to flooding, the electric, uh, the electric systems were dangerous, they weren't maintained, they were overused. And because housing is built to last, its defects are built to last. And because slum owners, slum property is very profitable, as houses get older, then conditions get worse, and the problems that have to be solved intensify. And the forecast is that by um, 2030, there'll be a 300% rise in old buildings which pose dangers to their tenants unless we start now to solve these problems. And the estimate at, at 2009 was that there were over, there were nearly 3,000 of these buildings that required immediate um, rehabilitation. And then, you know, the list of those who suffer goes on and on. So the disabled, they're left in distress. So hostels for the severely mentally disabled, I mean, these, in some ways, the most tragic cases, they can do nothing at all for themselves. They're severely <coughs> mentally disabled. The numbers are not so large, just over 2,000. The waiting time is almost seven years. So you think of it, an ordinary family with an, uh, 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 you know, a, a, a child or actually it gets worse as they become, become adults and you, the parents get older and you have to do everything for that individual in the cramped, often dirty, certainly not fit for um, a, a domiciliary care of somebody who's vulnerable, vulnerable 
and you're going to have to wait seven full, almost seven full years before you can get the special attention that they deserve. And maybe, maybe though, even the most shocking are, in terms of numbers, are the severely physical disabled and, and the care and attention homes, who are more intensive care. We've got less than 500 in each of these categories. I mean, why should they have to wait a year? 500. I mean, the figures are ridiculously small. So what's the obstacle other than the lack of compassion? So just let me come, you know, I said every sector. So education. I won't talk about the quality of education because fortunately, Hong Kong is gifted, blessed with teachers who really are professional, really, really do work to overcome the problems that are created by indifference amenities, lack of facilities, overcrowding, and so on. But I pick education at the top because both Jan Yam Kuhn and Dung Gin Wah said education is not really a social service, it's an investment. And they promised that through education, they would give a chance to the new generations to escape from poverty and have decent careers. So we look at the figures over the last 20 years. And in 1991, when we were much poorer than we are now, and you know, we were much less secure about the future because we hadn't passed through 1997 smoothly like we were to do in, in fact, in those days, more or less the same ratio of young people went to university, whether they were very poor or very rich. And the basic explanation for that is that the education system was about merit or talent. So you could get into DSS, what's now DSS schools, even though your family wasn't rich. You had talent. You had the capacity to study at a higher level. And the same for universities. We come to 2011, yeah, there's an improvement for those in the bottom level, the social security level. 13% now go to university compared with 8% 20 years ago. But look at the rise in the number from the, the richest group, almost half. Now, why is this? And it is plainly not true that the promises made by both Mr. Dung Ginhua and Jan Yam Kuhn about using education to lever people into new careers, new lives, and escape from, from poverty, these policies have simply not uh, um, achieved any worthwhile results. Why not? So just a couple of quotations for you. Jan Yam Kuhn said in 2005, the government must never try to assist the poor using its own resources. Question, who else's resources would you use? He said, this is doomed to failure. And he made the comparison. It's like pouring sand into the sea to reclaim land. But you know, the whole of Central is reclaimed in exactly that way. And look at the developers. You know, the idea that we stopped doing it broke their hearts. And then we come, we come uh, to last year, you know, uh, 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 our financial secretary, a man, you know, again, sincere, under great pressure, does his best, and so on. And he said, we should learn from countries where welfare populism, believed to be the principal cause of the accumulation of sovereign debts, has destroyed prosperity. Fortunately, he added, I am not an expert in these countries. He is not. The, the plight of countries like Greece, Italy, Portugal, and Ireland is not caused by excessive welfare. It is caused by the collapse of their banking system, and it is cutbacks in welfare which are paying the bills for that. And as for the United Kingdom, the disgraceful failure to regulate their banks is what has caused the austerity which is now being inflicted on their electorate. You know, I, Governments choose the ways they wish to solve their problems, but this had nothing to do with welfare. So let me just say something about social security. Most people in Hong Kong believe that um, social security is the path to idleness on the part of the workforce. They're convinced that if people can get unemployment pay, disability allowances, old age pensions, and so on, they'll stop working. So we look at the figures, you see. And if we look at these figures, 2001 to 2011, the interesting thing is that less, less than three, that three quarters, more than three quarters, over almost 80% of those who have no jobs do not get social security. Less than a quarter of them have ever applied for social security since we introduced the scheme in the 1990s. Hong Kong people, if they lose their jobs, three out of four, 
find some other way of staying alive. We do not know how they stay alive because the government has said efforts to try and find out through the normal census um, uh, surveys have proved a failure. They are too embarrassing. And then you look at the elderly, which is supposed to be threatening our future. Just look at the elderly. You know, have families walked away from, their, from obligations? Have they left the elderly to survive by themselves? So you look at it, that of the over 60s, less than 15%, 15% or less, have applied for social security. Overwhelmingly, they rely on however best they can manage. The average social security payments are so low, you know, they've gone up from 3,000 in 2001 to $3,700 now per head. But the average, the average earnings are around $11,000 a month. So nobody's going to give up a job, you know, in order to go and live on this. And as for affordability, well, last year, 2011, CSSA payments amounted to 3.6% of total government revenue. You know, this is a seriously affordable safety net. So what do we have now for the future? We have a crippling legacy that in the last 20 years, beginning and actually under, in the colonial era, we began to dismantle services to start to charge on a cost recovery basis. We, we decided that we would push the private sector to take over responsibilities from the public sector. So how are, we to, how are we to deal with these problems? Well, we start off by saying we have a legacy which cripples us. And Mr. Leung Jianying has found this out. He promised to solve our public housing pro problems. And he finds that to go back to the pre-2000 uh, uh, production cycle which we had, which was a model for so many other parts of the world and of which we boasted our public housing program. To go back to that will take five full years. Earlier I quoted the reduction in hospital beds of 8% in the first 10 years of this century. This year, this year, new administration announced a new target for the hospital authority, expand the number of hospital beds. And by um, 2021, this expansion program will bring the number of hospital beds back up to the figure it was in 2000. I mean, this is the rebuilding. It's like we've been devastated by some natural disaster. And, you know, I have to tell you frankly, although we attack the government, the bureaucracy, why are they not more efficient, more caring, they don't have any manpower, spare manpower, to handle these problems. They were shorn of manpower, and they encouraged voluntary redundancies. They were shrunk. They were discouraged from insisting that they needed more staff. So many agencies simply cannot even implement current laws and regulations. The Marine Department, in a report, beginning the reports on the ferry disaster, make it clear that one reason they didn't enforce the law on ferry safety is they don't have the staff. We look at education and health. The director of audit has castigated both those departments for their failure to supervise private sector uh, suppliers, providers, in accordance with what they promised. But it's plain that the Department of Health doesn't have the accountants to go and audit properly. And that's also true of the Education Department. There's no spare capacity. And you know, it's kind of pathetic. Statistics is the basis of all government. If you don't have figures, you don't have statistics, how can you make policy? And we found that there was a scandal earlier this year about whether something called the House or General Household Survey was um, uh, uh, falsifying the figures so guys could go home early from work? The answer was no, they weren't, but there was a problem because they'd abolished the special unit that had been set up to handle the most difficult kind of surveys. They don't have the technical expertise anymore. So I leave you a thought for the future. Both Jiang Yamkun and, and, and um, uh, uh, Dong Ginhua said that integration with the mainland was very important for the economy and they tried to, introduce, to get Hong Kong regarded as an important part of the, of the five-year plan. So we look at the five-year plan of China, the last one, the one that's still running, will run to 2015. And Prime Minister Wen Jiabao said that GDP-obsessed mentality had to go. And the targets were set for the 2011-2015 period, which include what Hong Kong would think were crippling welfare measures, but these are national goals. 
GDP would, growth rate would fall from 11 to 7% per annum, deliberate policy, and disposable incomes would rise by 7% per annum, and the minimum wage by at least 13%. And then medical services by 2012 under this, under this uh, uh, five-year plan were described officially as being more affordable and they stated fewer people are becoming poor or return to poverty because of illness. But that, that could not be said in Hong Kong. The reverse is true. And finally, Mr. Long Jianying has given us you know, an indication indirectly, perhaps unintentionally, that maybe we will have to pay more attention to standards set by the, by the mainland, which will be embarrassing for Hong Kong because we've always prided ourselves on the quality of we, life we offer here. He said, that for the five-year plan that will be announced in 2016, Hong Kong will have to view itself as a part of the nation, the family, and the polity. If this involves commitment to compassion, I dare say that Hong Kong people would be rather happy to have that turnout as he predicted. Thank you very much. Thank you. That takes us to the Q&A segment of today's event. If you want to ask a question, please raise your hand and wait for the microphone and um, state your name, please. Um, perhaps I'll, I'll, I'll kick off with, with a question of my own, Neil. Um, sorry, just switching your microphone on. Um, it seems from your presentation that um, Donald Trump's administration had gone much further than his predecessors in restricting government resources, restricting the use of government resources in um, alleviating poverty. How much of that mentality, do you think, has to do with his experience as finance secretary during the Asian financial crisis? Well, it, uh, unfortunately, um, you know, it, the question is not quite that simple, but his boss, the chief executive agreed to dismantle the public housing program. His boss, when he came into office, said, I'm determined to cut back on social security to prevent people from abuse, to, to squeeze abuse out of the system. And there wasn't any. It was his boss who uh, said that we should go ahead with educational reforms. So Donald, you know, is part of a process. The thing about Donald is he's just much more colorful when he explains the dreadful things that are happening um, than his predecessor. He's much more articulate and fluent. Uh, so, you know, it, this is the, the Asian financial crisis. We didn't have a financial crisis in Hong Kong in 1997 or 1998. Our banking system was amongst the most stable in the world as it was in the 2007-2009 crisis. And in fact, we pulled off a coup in the financial markets in 98 when we, when we destroyed the, the speculators and made an enormous profit by intervening in the market. So we could intervene in the market using public money, but we said we have to have austerity for social services. We could intervene in the market to abolish the government's role so that the private sector could you know, function like a market. But the people who went into gross negative equity were given no assistance whatsoever. And you could actually have on the record um, the financial secretary at the time saying, you know, we've got to let the market work its way out for the private, the, 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 the people who bought their own homes, having rescued the developers. I see a hand at the back there in the veranda. Yeah, my name is Tony Reid. Um, Hong Kong in the past uh, has had uh, an, a very good record of um, civil society providing uh, compassion and care for those who are poor um, and, uh, in my view, making up the gap for the lack of um, care from the, from the public and from the government. Um, in view of your analysis, uh, do you have any, any advice for those involved in NGOs and charities and organizations that are involved in that sort of work about how they should conduct themselves and what sort of advocacy they should be involved in? Well, one of the, one of the sad stories about Hong Kong is the way that advocacy has been diluted heavily by the fact that um, in Hong Kong, 
um, most of the welfare services, welfare services have been provided through NGOs, through voluntary agencies. And these people um, cannot possibly hope to provide high quality services just through charitable donations and the money they can raise themselves. So now they're put into a competitive business um, style situation because at the beginning of the century in 2000, 2001, a new director of social welfare said that business shows you how to deliver efficient services and then that you know NGOs have to learn the business model but quite frankly you know th th there is no profit to be made from a dementia patient and the same official later on went on to say we should deal with you know one of the big things for old people is to give them choice so we should rate residential premises for them like we ra rank hotels you know by stars and, you know, my answer to that is, so, I have dementia, and I'm not being treated here well. You think I can just go down the road like I could for a hotel? It's just not like that. I mean, it shows a complete lack of understanding of the plight of people who have disabilities, who, who, who can't manage, who are vulnerable, can't manage by themselves. So, part of the problem is that we've decided the business model works for welfare, and it doesn't. So, NGOs in Hong Kong, again, they have saved the day by somehow managing to find the way to maintain their goals, maintain their commitments, even though the pressure's on them to become business-like, to become finance-orientated are so, are, so, are so large. But I think we're getting now to breaking point, that we cannot continue to provide the kind of services that the community desperately needs and in the quantity it needs, um, unless we accept that the government must finance it freely. And these are the waiting time figures which I put up on the screen for you. Next question, uh, it's a gentleman in the dark jacket on the left. Um, in your opinion, <clears throat> how many, or what degree of our poverty-related problems is related on a statistical basis to the fact that our policymakers, by and large, come from an extremely privileged background, and that covers everyone from our current CE, EXCO, and even the, the non-elected members of LegCo. So we're in this, this dire situation whereby everyone deciding on poverty is decidedly not in a poverty situation, statistically. Well, you know, um, I, couldn't, I couldn't accept that as an explanation for anything, because that would mean that if you come from a privileged background, you don't have to care about anybody else. And, you know, in real life, that's not the case. I'm not quite sure, by the way, that the description of all these gentlemen and ladies as coming from privileged backgrounds is accurate. I have the disadvantage of knowing most people's grandfathers or fathers if they're in public life. And, you know, it, it isn't like that. The problem here is that, you know, it's very easy to be distant from the vulnerable in a community like ours. There's no, there's, no, uh, there's no votes in welfare. There's no penalty for being bad to people. So, you know, if we take, if we take a simple example, there are just over 6,000 children under the age of six who have problems they were born with which affect their ability to have a proper education. We know, we know that if you can get them into early intervention, preschool intervention, they have a very good chance of, you know, just going through school in the normal way. Why is it that the waiting time for these children has gone up by 50% in the last five years? And the answer is, it's just a figure. Nobody, most people who have anything to do with this issue have never seen such a child or met such a family. And unfortunately, you know, in a society which is like ours, where we take it for granted, we can solve all our own problems. Unless we're brought face to face, it doesn't move us. 30, 40 years ago, that couldn't have been true. If you were living in public housing then, resettlement blocks, Mark 1 in particular, you know, everybody's problems were there for you to see. And if you lived in resettlement, it wasn't because you were poor. You know, you were being cleared from sites. So you couldn't help but see the ordinary, ordinary tragedies that come to a community in its life. And you also had another factor then, which was that so many people 30, 40 years ago, 30 or 40 years ago who were poor the poverty could be blamed on war or civil war or revolution. And you didn't say, hey, it's your fault, your own fault. And finally, they worked in factories. So you have a guy coming to work, 
and you've got a rush order to the states, and he's your pattern maker. He gets it wrong. The order will not be made to specifications. And he doesn't look well. The boss will say to him, you know, you've got a factory with a thousand workers, big factory in those days. What's wrong with you? He says, you know, my kid, you know, very worried, fever all night. You know, you know the guy. You know he's not going to mess you around. You give him money, doctor now. Get him right. He's part of the family. You've got to look at what the Shanghainese, these wealthy Shanghainese, whose sons and daughters are part of our political establishment now. In the 50s, they had model factories with model sukse and model medical schemes. And, you know, they were the richest, and they did it because these are my workers. If they're not happy, how are they going to do a good job for me? We don't have factory relationships like that now. You know, the workers are as anonymous as the products that they mostly sell. So, you know, society has changed. Uh, lady in front put her hand up first, <laughs> then Joe afterwards. Thank you very much for your presentation. Um, my name is Julia Ip. Um, I have a question regarding the uh, recently introduced poverty, official poverty line that been introduced by the government. Uh, there's a lot of contra uh, controversy surrounding how accurately it reflect the uh, poverty situation in Hong Kong. Even the government refused to set a target uh, regarding what is strategy towards um, lowering the poverty line down the road. Um, in your opinion, how well, say, for the uh, um, other NGOs or, or people who are concerned about the poverty situation in Hong Kong can make use of this in an index? Uh, or, is, or is it just an embarrassing stunt by the government? Well, this is kind of difficult for me because by profession I'm an economist, not a social worker. And I love broad figures, of course, and averages. And you heard me quoting them, you know. So I should really love a poverty line, but I don't. A poverty line says you've got a million poor people, but it doesn't tell you anything more than that about them. And in a sense, it suggests that it's only about money, cash, but it's not. The figures I put up show definitely it's poverty is not just about cash. That you, even if you don't, if people don't go for cash to social security, They'll be poor, but somehow they're surviving. The kind of poverty I'm talking about is nice middle-class family. Husband's earning $50,000 a month, wife earning $30,000 a month. They've got a child, you know, uh, got an armor, a, a Filipina, a, a foreign domestic helper, hopes the child will go to Cambridge, you know, and all the rest of it. And then suddenly the husband is uh, diagnosed with uh, prostate cancer. And suddenly... His life depends on qualifying for this new you know, group of seven, seven uh, uh, cancer drugs. Will he get it? Will he be treated properly? Or he borrows money to go and get you know, diagnosis, go into the private sector. And we're talking about you know, money on a scale there which is unimaginable. You know, somebody comes to me with that in the middle class, I say, go to London. You'll have it done in half the time at, at least half the cost. You know? I mean, so this, this is a situation where we don't spread the risks of tragedy across the whole community, which we should do in a civilized society. I mean, these are, these are affordable insurance risks. And we've spent 20 years waiting for a medical insurance scheme. And we were promised that there would be the detailed medical insurance scheme for the community to deal with and get on with by the middle of this year. Admittedly, the last administration promised it, but there's no magic about these things. And we're told, well, the insurance companies don't like this, and you know, there's a majority of the population against compulsory scheme. Well, you know, there's a majority of the population against compulsory uh, 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 salaries tax, too. But, you know, if you want to solve the problem, you just say pay. I mean, it's, I don't see what the problem is. This is about government. So my answer is the poverty line is a danger, and it could distract us from the real issues. Um, can Joel in front have the microphone next? Uh, Mr. Goodstad, that was a terrific history lesson, especially your reference to the 1998 uh, market intervention, which really had a huge ideological screaming and yelling here, I remember, uh, similar to what happened when Obama's administration stopped following the, the Bush's policies that saved the auto industry, which of course also saved MG, General Motors and, and whatever. But so that brings me to my next question, because what you're I, I'm really, your amazing presentation, I'm hearing echoes, echoes of, well, as the American right wing stuff going back to Goldwater, 
Uh, the poor had it coming. The, uh, what's his name, uh, uh, Thomas Freeman, railing against the war on the poor and all that, uh, and uh, Elizabeth Warren's positions. I, I think it's what you're talking about, is it at all ideologically driven, or is it simply well-meaning bureaucrats trying to save the black ink at the bottom line of the treasury? Uh, which would mean then, isn't Hong Kong in a better position uh, on a GDP basis than America to meet its obligations? I, I said we've got to, we can afford it, yes. So the question I'm being asked, if I may uh, put it into a, an easier form for myself, is this. A lot of what the government says in Hong Kong sounds like what governments elsewhere, particularly the states, but also the UK, says for ideological reasons that you know the, a political party has one view rather than another. And there is a fashion in politics about how governments should fund welfare, social services, education and housing. And the fashion in the 1980s and the 1990s was to say the public sector is inefficient and the public sector could do it much better. Now, I'm not going to talk about other countries. I know nothing about other countries. I know about Hong Kong and something about Kowloon too on a good day. <laughs> but we didn't have a problem with our civil service. We did not have a civil service where productivity was low, where there was opposition to innovation. We had constant innovation. They created a modern education system after the introduction of comp compulsory education up to the age of 16 in 1978. As late as that, we created a modern education system with really first-class secondary schools and decent universities in the 20 years that followed. We had dreadful standards in part of the uh, medical system we had, the voluntary sector. And in the 1990s, we transformed the whole medical sector into something which stands, you know, uh, actually stands comparison, I'm wrong, is better than the services in many, many other cities. And the welfare system, similarly, we, we made a commitment in 1991 to provide welfare to everybody who needed it, simply because they were deprived, disadvantaged, disabled, or at risk. We did, we did all those things, so we did not have a problem. But fashion is fashion, and um, people at the top, people you know, in government, business, they mix with the opinion makers and the fashion leaders and the political uh, uh, pundits of the world one way or another, and they imported it into Hong Kong. So I mean, that's really what explains these strange statements by Hong Kong standards that I quoted to you in my presentation. Um, unfortunately, we've only got time for one more question. The gentleman at the back, please. Thank you, Leo Good, Mr. Leo Goodset, for your amazing presentation. Uh, my name is Alan. I'd like to ask uh, you another question regarding uh, social welfare. Macau just uh, announced their $9,000 distribution scheme. Do you think that the uh, scheme that we used a few years back, the $6,000 distribution scheme, would be a short-term remedy uh, or solution to the poverty problem or maybe, say, what are your views on, on, on short-term or long, longer-term remedies? For example, maybe the universal pension or uh, other remedies like that. Thank you. Well, it, it's, it's an interesting question. And I think what you're asking me to do is to, um, is to say it was nonsense. The $6,000 handout was nonsense. It went to you. It went to me. Um, the most important thing about that handout exercise was the skill which was Treasury, the government's um, financial people, invented a system to deliver $6,000 to every single permanent resident through a banking system at relatively little cost. I mean, this was such, such ingenuity, you know. And they continued to work for the government, although they could have commanded any job they liked in, uh, in, uh, 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 in, the, in the banking industry in this region. So $6,000 is just outrageous. To offer me $6,000, you know, is just disgusting. And, um, you know, it, it wasn't focused on the poor. And the idea that goodwill can be bought in Hong Kong for $60,000 or $600,000 shows a gap between um, the rulers and the ruled. I mean, the wonderful thing about Hong Kong is people are so intelligent they look at television, they listen, they read the newspapers, and somehow they know the truth. I'm afraid um, that's all we have time for. Um, a little souvenir from the club. 
Thank you again for joining us today.